the similarity of the Romanov couple to the French royal pair of the epoch of the Great Revolution is very obvious. It has already been remarked in literature, but only in passing and without drawing interferences. Nevertheless, it is not at all accidental as appears as the at the first glance, but offers valuable material for an inter inference for an inference. Although separated from each other by five quarter centuries, the Tsar and the king were at certain moments like two actors playing the same role. A passive, patient, but vindictive treachery was the distinctive trait of both with this difference. That is, Louis, it was dis disguised with the dubious Kind, kindliness in Nicholas with affability. They both made the impression of people who are overburdened by their job, but at the same time unwilling to give up when even a, even a part of those rights of which they are unable to make any, any use. The diaries of both, similar in style or lack of style, reveal the same depressing spiritual emptiness. The Austrian woman and the Hessian German from also a striking sy symmetry. Both queens stand above their kings, not only in physical but also in moral growth. Maria Antoniet was less pious than Alexandra Feodorovna, and unlike the, lat the latter, was passionately fond of pleasure. But both alike scorned the people could not endure the thought of concessions alike mistrusted the courage of their husbands. Looking down upon them, Antonia with, the with a shade of con contempt, Alexandra with pity. When the authors of memoirs appro approaching the Petersburg court of their day assure us that Nicholas II had been a private individual will have left a good memory behind him. They merely reproduced the long ago stereotyped remarks about Louis XVI, not enriching in the least our knowledge either of history or, hum of, of, or of human nature. We have already seen how Prince Lvov became indignant when, at the aid of the tragic events of the First Revolution, instead of depressed Tsar, he found before him a jolly, springly little man in a rasp raspberry-colored shirt. Without knowing it, the prince merely repeated the comment of Governor Morris writing in Washington in 1790 about Louis. What will you have from a creature who, situated as he is, eats and drinks and sleeps well, and laughs and is a merry agreed as lives. When Alexandra Feodorovna, three months before the fall of the monarchy, prophesizes, all is coming out for the best, the dreams of our friend mean so much. She merely repeats Marie Antoniette, who one month before the overthrow of the royal power wrote, I feel a liveness of spirit and something tells me that we shall soon be happy and safe. They both see rainbow dreams as they, as they drown. Certain elements of similarity of course are accidental and have the interest only of historic anecdotes. Indefinitely more important are those traits of character which have been grafted or more directly imposed on a person by the mighty force, the mighty force of conditions, and which threw a sharp light on the in interrelation of personality and the objective factors of history. He did not know how to which that was his chief trait of character, says a reactionary French historian of Louis. Those words might have been written of Nicholas. Neither of them knew how to which, but both knew how to not which. But what really could be witched by the last representatives of a hopelessly lost historic cause? 
Usually he listened it, smiled and r rarely decided upon anything. His first word was usually no. Of whom is that writing? Again, of Capet. But if this is so, the manners of Nicholas were an absolute pla plagiarism. They both go toward the abyss with the crowd pushed down over their eyes. But will, but will it after all be easier to go to an abyss which you cannot escape anyway with your eyes open? What difference will it have made as a matter of fact if they had pushed the crown way back on their heads? Some professional psychologists ought to draw, draw up an anthology of the parallel expressions of Nicholas and Louis, Alexandra and Antonia, under con under count Cortis. There will be no lack of material, and the result will be a highly instructive historic testimony in favor of the materialist psychology. Materialist psych psychology. Similar, of course, far from it identical. Ir irritations in similar conditions call out similar reflexes. The more powerful the irritation, the sooner it overcomes personal peculiari peculiarity peculiarities. To a tickle, to a tickle, people react differently, but to a red hot iron alike. As a steam hammer converts the sphere and a cube alike into a sheet material, uh, into sheet metal. So under the blow of two great and in inexorable events, resistances are smashed and the boundaries of individuality lost. Louis and Nicholas were the last born of a, a dynasty that had lived tumult tumultuously. The well-known equability, equability of them both, their tranquility and, they, and gaiety, in difficult moments, were the well-breed breed expression of a migraineness of inner powers, a weakness of the nervous discharge, poverty of spiritual resources, moral castrates, they were absolutely deprived of imagination and create creative force. They had just enough brains to feel their own triviality and they cherished an envious hostility towards the everything gifted and significant. It fell to, it fell to them both the, to rule a country in conditions of deep inner crisis and popular revolutionary awakening. awakening. Both of them fought off the intrusion, intrusion of new ideas on the tide of hostile forces. Indecisiveness, hypocrisy, and lying were in both, case, in both cases the expression not so much of personal weakness as of the complete impossibility of holding fast to their hereditary positions. And how was it with and how was and how was it with their wives? Alexandra more than Antonia was lifted to the very age of the dreams of a princess, especially such a rural one as this Haitian, by her marriage with the unlimited despot of a powerful country. Both of them were filled to the bring with the consciousness of their high mission. Antonia, more frivolously, Alexandra, in a spirit of Protestant bigotry, translated into the Slavonic language of the Russian church, an unlucky ring, and a growing discontent of the people ruthlessly destroyed the fantastic world which this too enterprising, but nevertheless, chicken-like, chicken-like heads had built, had built for themselves. Hence the growing bitterness, the gnawing hostility to an alien people that will not bow before them. The hatred toward ministers who wanted to give even a little consideration to that hostile world, to the country. Hence their alienation even from their own court and their continued 
irritation against a husband who had not fulfilled the expectations aroused by him as a bridegroom. Historians and biographers of the psychological tendency not infrequently seek and find something purely personal and accidental where great historical forces are refracted through a personality. This is the same fault of vision that of the courtes who considered the last Russian Tsar born unlucky. He himself believed that he was born under an unlucky star. In reality, his ill luck flowed from the contra contradictions between those, those old aims which he iner inherited from his ancestors and the new historic conditions in which he was placed. When the ancients said that Jupiter first makes mad those who, whom he wishes to destroy, they sum it up in superstitious form, a profound historic observation. In the, laying, in the saying of Goethe about reason becoming unsense, ver nunf vir unsin, this same thought is expressed about the impersonal Jupiter of the historical dialect which withdraws reason from historical institutions that have outlived themselves and condemns their defenders of, to failure. The scripts for the roles of Romanov and Capet were prescribed by the general development of the historic drama. Only the nuances of interpretation fell to the lot of the actors. The ill luck of Nicholas and, Lu and of Louis had its roots not in his personal horos horoscope, but in the historical horoscope of the bureaucratic case monarchy. They were both chiefly and above all the last born offspring of absolutism, their moral, insi their, their moral insignificance deriving from their dynastic epigonism gave the latter an, an especially malignant character. You might object. If Alexander III had drunk less, he might give Livet a good deal longer. The revolution would have run into a very different make of Tsar, and no parallel without with Louis XVI would have been possible. Such an objection, however, does not refute in the least what has been said above. We do not at all pretend to deny the significance of the personal in the, mechanis in the mechanics of the historic process, nor the significance in the personal of the accidental. We only demand that historic personality will all its with all its peculiarities should not, to take, should not be taken as a bare list of psychological traits but as a living reality grown out of definite social conditions and reacting upon them. As a rose does not lose its fragrance because the natural scientist points out upon what ingredients of soil and atmosphere it is nourished, so an exposure of the social roots of a personality does not remove from it either its aroma or its full smell. The consideration advanced above about a possible long life of Alexander III is capable of illumining this very problem from another side. Let us assume that this Alexander III had not become mixed up in 1904 in a war with Japan. This will, this will have delayed the first revolution. For how long? It is possible that the revolution of 1905, that is the first test of strength, the first breach in the system of absolutism, will have been a mere introduction to the second, Republican, and the third, Proletarian Revolution. Upon this question, more or less interesting guesses are possible, but it is in indubitable in any case that the revolution did not result from the from the character of Nicholas II, and that Alexander III will not, will not have solved its problem. It is enough to remember that nowhere and never was the transition from the feudal to the bourgeois, to the bourgeois regime 
made without violent disturbances. We saw this only yesterday in China. Today we observe it again in India. The most we can say is that this or that policy of the monarchy, this or that personality, oh, the monarch might have hated, hastened or postponed the revolution and placed a certain imprint on its external course. With that angry and imponent stubbornness, charisma tried to defend itself in those last months, weeks and days when it gained when it gained was hopelessly lost. If Nicholas himself lacked lacked the will, the lack was made up by the Tsarina. Rasputin was an ins instrument of the action of a clique which rapidly fought to self-preservation. Even on this narrow scale, the personality of the Tsar emerges in a group which represents the coagulum of the past and its last convulsion, the policy of the upper circles at Tsarsko Selo, face to face with the revolution, but, we, but the reflexes of a poisoned and weak beast of prey. If you chase all wolf over the step in an automobile the beast gives out a lass and lie and lie down impotent impotent but attempt to put a collar on him and he will try to tear you to pieces or at least wound you and indeed what else can he does can he do in that in the circumstances the liberals imagined there was there was something else he might do. Instead of coming to an agreement with the enfranchised bourgeoisie in good reason, in good season, and thus preserve, preventing the revolution such in liberalism act, in liberalism's act of accusation against the last Tsar Nikolai, Nicholas stubbornly shrank from con concessions. And even in the last days, when already under the knife of destiny, when every minute was to be counted, still kept of procrastinating, bargaining with fate, and letting slip the last possibilities. This all sounds convincing, but how, how unfortunate did that liberalism, knowing so accurately how to save the monarchy, did not know how to save itself. It would be abs absurd to maintain the Tsarism never and in no circumstances made concessions. It made them when they were demanded by the necessity of self-preservation after the Crimean defeat. Alexander II carried out the semi-liberation semi of the peasants and a series of liberal reforms in the sphere of land, administration, courts, press, educational institutions, etc. The Tsar is himself expressed the guiding, the guiding thought of this reformation to free the peasants from above, lest they free themselves from below. Under the drive of the First Revolution, Nicholas II granted a semi-constitution Stolypin scrapped the peasant communes in order to broaden the arena of the capitalist forces. For Tsarism, however, all these reforms had a meaning only insofar as the partial concessions preserved the whole, the whole that is, the foundations of the caste society and the monarchy, the monarchy itself. When the consequence of the reform began to splash over the, those boundaries, the monarchy inevitably beat a retreat. Alexander II in the second half of his reign stole back the reforms of the first half. Alexander III went still farther of the road of counter-reform. Nicholas II in October 1905 retreated before the revolution and then afterward dissolved the Dumas created by it. And as soon as the revolution grade grew weak, made his coup d'etat. Throughout three quarters of a century, if we begin with the reform of Alexander II, there developed a struggle of, of historic forces. 
now on the ground, now in the open, far transcending of the personal qualities of this separate course and accomplishing the overthrow of the monarchy. Only within the historic framework of this process can you find a place for individual cars, their character, their biographies.